We present Cecil Parker and Naunton Wayne in Daughters-in-Law by Henry Cecil, adapted by the author from his new book of the same name, with Goodwin Ewer and Diana Olson. Daughters-in-Law. But, my dear Major, why not? <clears throat> why not? Why not? I'll tell you why not, Archie. But first, draw me another pint, will you? Certainly, Major. Ah. But, you know, you're just the sort of man they want on the local bench. Why won't you let your name go forward? Because I won't have anything to do with the law. That's why. The Buttonstep family has been ruined by lawyers, and in my view, they're all alike. Barristers, solicitors, judges, the whole boiling lot. Parasites. But J.P.'s aren't lawyers, Major. They have a clerk to help them make their legal mistakes. Judges have to make them all on their own. Well, what's that got to do with it? J.P.'s administer the law, don't they? Someone has to. Well, it isn't going to be me. Upon the word, I believe it was one of those blooming police courts that helped to ruin one of my family. A case of poaching, it was. A fellow bagged a pheasant and it dropped in the road. Now, any sensible, honest person would have said that that was poaching. Well, the fellow even admitted it when he was caught. Then what was the case about? Well, I'm telling you, the chap admitted it. But would that do for the lawyers? Oh, dear me, no. Where was it when it was actually shot? It might have been over the road. If it was over the road, was it over public property? <laughs> what happened? Well, you may well ask. I tell you, they argued for two years whether the road was public property or not. <laughs> and for another two, whether it made any difference. <laughs> now, you won't believe this, but it's true. After two years, they found the road was public property, and after another two, that it didn't make any difference. Well, the fellow had gone to Australia by then. How often have you done that sort of thing? I've certainly never heard of a case in our police court that lasted more than a week. You can't mean it really took four years. Oh, no, 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 not just in the police court. You don't think the lawyers would be satisfied with that? No wigs or gowns there. Oh, no. Somehow or other, they got it into the high court with three flipping judges looking at 50 flipping books and asking 50 million flipping questions about them. It was a blooming scandal. Here was a fellow, caught red-handed, and to hear the Lord Chief Justice talking, you'd have thought it was the Titchbourne case all over again. I know. I heard him. You must have been very young. Well, I was, but old enough to understand why our family lost nearly everything that used to belong to it. Tell me, Sir George, I remember the old judge saying... How do you reconcile Naylor and Nubkin with Settle and Holiday? <laughs> and you know, Sir George, whatever his name was, spent two days explaining why he couldn't reconcile them. Two days at a hundred guineas a day, mark you. My poor old cousin's money. And at the end of it, the judge said with a smile, Well, Sir George, we seem to be back where we started. Well, he could afford to smile. So could the lawyers. They could afford to blooming well laugh. <laughs> no, 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 Archie, no. <laughs> Now, there are going to be no judges, qualified or unqualified, in the Buttonstep family. But, uh, Major, suppose Digby and John had become lawyers. Ah, oh, not with Buttonstep blood in them. <laughs> Mind you, Digby had to learn a bit of law before he became a chartered accountant, but no doubt he soon forgot it when he got into practice. By the way, how are they both doing? Well, wonderfully. John has just bought another 50 acres, and Digby's a partner in one of the best-known firms in the city. Any sign of them marrying? Well, not as far as I know. Suppose they married into a legal family. <laughs> no, 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 it's no use, Archie. <laughs> I'm not going on the bench. <laughs> and trying to annoy me by talking about Digby and John marrying into a legal family won't make me change. Well, they wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. They know my views. <laughs> no, they've got two nice girls with them at the moment. Couldn't possibly be lawyers. Prunella, darling. I don't know how I'm going to break it to Father. My dear sweet Digby, don't you think he'll like me? He'll like you, all right, but not your profession. The idea of a barrister in the family, even a girl, will shake the old boy, I'm afraid. Even a girl? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're a marvel. <laughs> Marshal Hall isn't in it. You will be a QC and the first woman judge. <laughs> You'll go to the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords. <laughs> and I love you. Ah, that's better than all the rest. But seriously, will it really upset your father so much? I'm afraid it will. And what makes it worse is John getting engaged to your sister. Mm. You a barrister and Jane a solicitor. Well, I really am worried. Oh, dear. I can't believe he feels as badly about them as all that. 
Parasites, I tell you, Archie. Barristers, solicitors. There's only one thing worse, and that's a judge. Sarcastic devils. I've heard them at it. Do yourself justice, Mr. Wotherspoon. Don't you know the difference between your left hand and your right hand? No, thank you. No judges for the button steps. You ask Digby. And your father's a high court judge, Prunella, too. He's a very good one. They say he's one of the few judges who can rarely get at the truth in a difficult case. I know, but there isn't such a thing as a good judge in father's eyes. He looks upon them all as Judge Jeffrey. <laughs> well, that's why John and I have never taken either of you home. No point in worrying the old boy until things were pretty certain. But now we'll have to break it to him. Thank heavens you're both such beauties. <laughs> He's got an eye for a pretty face. <laughs> Let's hope that'll help to counteract the legal side of you. Mm, we'll know soon enough. Do you know, I don't believe we've had such a bevy of beauty here since the war. <laughs> well, Digby and John ought to have brought you home before. Oh, yeah. Miss Coombe? Thank you, Major. And Miss Coombe? Thank you. Oh, just the occasion for a drink, this. Your good health, my dear. And yours, Major. And yours, Major. <laughs> yeah, and how long have you known John? Jane, uh, you're much too young to be called Miss Coop. Oh, please do call me Jane. Uh, about a year altogether, I suppose. A year? Well, really, John, I should have thought... Oh, Father, haven't those roses with the big saucer-like blooms? Those? Well, we've had them for years. With mermaid. And what do you do for a living, Prunella? Or are you a lady of leisure? Father, uh, what are those some yellow ones near the greenhouse? I love roses, don't you, John? Do you look after them yourself, Major? <laughs> well, I, I potter about a bit, you know. And... Oh, it's just like father. Yes. And what is your father, my dear? But you were telling me about your job. Now I've forgotten what it was. Father, what's the difference between fashion and friendship? Oh, surely you know that, John. Well, uh, fashion... It... But I was interrupting Prunella. You were telling me what you did. Major, is there a button-step rose yet? Well, it's... It's in the melting pot at the moment. Oh. <laughs> you see. But what do you do, Prunella? I shall begin to think it's something shady if you hold back any more. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm a barrister. Oh. And you, Jane? Well, I'm a solicitor, as a matter of fact. Oh. Uh, they couldn't really help it, Father. You see, their father's a judge. Oh. I'm sorry, Father, I didn't mean to make it worse. Really, Father, we'd have told you before, and only... You see, Why so embarrassed? We all know there are barristers and solicitors, and we all know that the profession, if that's the right word, is open to both sexes. There's no reason why my two sons shouldn't bring home two young... young lawyers to dinner. There's no special significance in it, is there? There's no special significance in it. Is there? Oh. Well, if you'll forgive me. I've rather a headache. You'll find me in the study if you want me, Digby. John. Oh, dear. Oh, it's even worse than I thought it would be, but we had to tell him sometime. We'd better go and see him straight away, Digby. Mm, I'm afraid I was very clumsy about it. Oh, and I was too. Oh, it wasn't your fault at all. It's ours, if anybody's. Oh, come on, John. We must see what we can do. Ah, uh, Digby and John. I'm glad you followed me. Now, we must have this thing out. But first of all, are you both serious? I'm afraid so, Father. Oh, my God. Now, look. You know that I only want you to be happy, don't you? Well, of course we do, Father, and we want you to be happy about it, too. Well, then, listen. Happiness doesn't just consist in getting married to a kind, intelligent and attractive girl. Believe me, there's something far more worthwhile than the exciting love between two young people. It's the development that counts. And whether it develops into that glorious state of permanent happiness that your mother and I shared... Depends upon a number of things. There's no doubt of it in our case. Oh, wait a moment. One of the things on which it depends is tradition. Your family has hated lawyers from time immemorial. They've been bled white by them. I can even speak from experience. 
It cost me over fifty pounds to sack a dishonest chauffeur. But I thought you won the case. Well, of course I won the case, but that's to say the other chap lost it. But no one can win a case at law, except the lawyers. They win the lot. It's in their blood. Well, they can't help it. Any more than a stoke can help killing a rabbit. And I don't want a lot of bloodsuckers for my grandchildren. But really, Father, they're not all like that. Look, why don't you meet old Coombe? He's not half a bad old boy. Not half a bad old boy. <laughs> Ever heard of Judge Jeffries? Well, they haven't changed since then. Really? Oh, I know that their manners are better, and they don't get the chance of hanging as many people as they'd like to, but that's not their fault. They would if they could. Prunella wouldn't want to hang anyone, nor would Jay. Well, of course they wouldn't. They're very nice girls, I'm sure. And I dare say their father is, as a man. He is, really. So are all lawyers before the law gets into their blood. Do you think that these judges who are so bloodthirsty on the bench are different from other men by nature? Do you think these barristers and solicitors who soak you for thousands and then tell you how sorry they are that you lost, but the judge was very difficult, do you think they're different from you and me by nature? Well, of course not. But then what's troubling you, Father? What's troubling me is that they haven't been left to nature. The law's got into their blood and made them what they are. There's no profession which takes so much from you and gives you nothing in return. The architect gives you a new house. The doctor a new tummy. The accountant a balance sheet. And what does a lawyer leave you with? A bill of costs. For generations, our family has hated them with a bitter, permanent, implacable hatred. For God's sake, don't you two let me down. Well, I didn't know you felt quite as strongly as that, Father. Not quite so strongly. Oh. Look what they've done to us, these lawyers. We used to own three quarters of the land round here. Button Step Village belonged to us. Now what have we got? Half an acre and lucky to have that. Look, let me show you something. <coughs> Look, do you see these papers? Good Lord. You may well say good Lord. In the estate of Charles Button Step deceased. Bradley versus Button Step. Button Step versus the Queen. The Queen against Button Step. Button Step against Button Step and so on and so on. <sighs> Uh, look at the courts we've been through. We've done the lot. Police court, county court, high court, court of appeal, privy council, house of lords. And now, I suppose, my grandchildren are going to be John Buttonstep, Esquire, Barrister at Law. Mr. Justice Buttonstep, Lord Justice Buttonstep. I hope I'm dead before it happens. But, Father, really, our children may not want to be lawyers. They may hate them like you do. Well, they won't be able to help it. The coom blood will be too strong for them. Now, Mr. Justice Coombe comes from what they call a long line of distinguished judges. They were distinguished, all right. One of them ruined your great-great-grandfather with a wicked judgment. Wicked, I tell you. Oh, it was upset by the House of Lords, all right. And they said it was, well, they didn't say wicked. Dog, don't eat dog. But they used legal language for saying that the judge was talking through his hat. Much good, that was. Your great-great-grandfather was dead by then. But the button-step blood may prove stronger than the coom. You know, all our children may be like you. Don't you believe it? Even in the womb, the lawyers will find a way. For all we know, he'll take legal proceedings in there, and the child that's born will be the result of a nolly prosequi, or some other of their beastly Latin phrases. Why can't they talk English in an English court? I bet half of them don't know what they're saying. They pronounce it all wrong anyway. My dear boys... Do, for heaven's sake, think it over. All right, Father. We will. Well, thank goodness. Well, you better take the girls home. Good night. Is there any hope, Digby? Oh, not much, Prunella. I wonder if your father would be able to suggest anything? Well, Sir George... It's very good of you to have listened to me so patiently. But Prunella and I just didn't know what to do about my father. We thought you might be able to make him see reason. I don't know about that, Digby. But your father seems to come from a very litigious family. They may hate lawyers, but they've certainly been benefactors to the legal profession. I should rather be inclined to think that the trouble springs from your family having lost too many cases. You mean they're really fond of litigation, but it's proved too expensive? Hmm. Like a racing man gives it up because he loses. What's the cure, sir? No, I'm afraid I can't suggest that. With a racing man, it would be different. Let him win a few bets and he'll be as keen as ever again. Yeah. But with your father, I'm afraid I just don't know. Well, thank you for seeing me anyway. 
Good night, sir. He can't think of anything, John. Well, we must, Digby. But if old Coombe can't, I don't see how we can. He's got the most terrific reputation in the city. They say he can nose out anything. What's the good of that to us? What exactly did he say? He just said the family's lost too many cases. <laughs> Well, Major, are you any happier about your boys? Well, there's life as hope, Archie. They haven't mentioned the subject for the last month, so I haven't either. You say they're nice enough girls. Oh, charming. If it wasn't for what they are, I could have fallen for one myself. <laughs> it seems an awful shame if they have to give them up. Yes, I know. But as far as I'm concerned, if they marry, it'll be like a devout Roman Catholic marrying a heathen. It's unthinkable. Well, I'm off. Tell Digby I've gone up to the farm if he comes in. Okay, Major. Right, thanks so much. See you later. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, not at all. No, no, I'm so I, sorry. I was in the way. My, my fault entirely. Not sorry. at all. That, that, that. Oh, what a charming man. Um, pint of bitter, please. A uh, pint of bitter it is. Will you have one, my lord? Oh, that's very good of you, thanks. I'll have the same. Well, cheers. Cheers. I haven't seen you before. Passing through? No, I've just come to Buttonstep. I've taken the house by the common. And more. Oh, nice little place. Hope you'll like it here. Look, I suppose you don't happen to know... Hello, a... Digby. Uh, Your father's just been in. He's gone to the farm, if you want him. Oh, no, thanks. This gentleman's just taken Enmore. <laughs> oh. How do you do? My name's Buttonstep. Oh, uh, mine's Trotter. Your name's Buttonstep, is it? What, uh, same as the village? You own the whole place, I imagine. <laughs> uh, well, the family used to. Only the name now, I'm afraid. Uh, forgive my asking you, but I suppose you don't know anyone who could lend me a motor mower by any chance. The grass at the back is pretty thick. My father might lend you his. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? I don't suppose he would, but I'll ask him. Well, that's really most civil of you. If everyone's as kind round here, I'm going to enjoy myself. What do you have? Oh, now, that really is kind. I ought to be giving you one. Another time. When's that fellow Trotter bringing the mower back? You told me he'd promised it for today. I'm terribly sorry, Father. I thought he'd brought it. I'll pop down and see him. Well, it's all right. The morning will do. It's, it's just that I like people to keep their promises. <laughs> Terribly sorry, Father. He says he clean forgot all about it. He'll bring it up this morning. Well, thanks, Digby. Oh, well, we all forget sometimes, I suppose. What time is he bringing it up? About 11.30, if that's all right. I say, Digby, uh, this is too bad. He can't have forgotten it again. Do you mean to say he's not brought it up? That's exactly what I do mean to say. Well, I'm terribly sorry. I ought never to have said you'd lend it to him. I'll go straight down now. Well, thanks. Well, it's not your fault. I'm sorry, Father. You're not going to be pleased. What do you mean? Well, I went down to his house and knocked, and nothing happened. Then he put his head out of the window and, and said he'd got mumps in the house. What on earth's that got to do with it? Yeah, well, he, he said he wasn't feeling too good himself and couldn't let me into the house when I said I'd never had mumps. Oh, this is past a joke. I'll go down myself. Have you had mumps? No, but there's a back door, isn't there? Uh, no, you have to go through the house. Well, he can put it in the front garden, can't he? And I can pick it up from there. Uh, I suggested that. Uh, but he said he didn't feel strong enough to get it up the steps at the back. Well, confound the man. Not strong enough. Oh, really? Number, please. Oh, Mrs. Templey... Uh, would you kindly give me Mr. Trotter of Enmore House? Certainly, Major. It's ringing now. Hello? Is that Mr. Trotter? Oh, yes, it, it is. But only just. I'm feeling very weak. Oh, this is Claude Button's step here. Oh, how do you do? I've been wanting to thank you for the mower. Oh, it was most kind. Uh, when can I have it back? Ah, now that's a problem, isn't it? Well, I see no problem, 
If you'd kindly put it in your front garden, I'll fetch it. Well, I hate to put you to all this trouble. Well, never mind. I, I want the moor. I'd much rather bring it back to you in a week or so, when I feel a little stronger. I'm afraid I want it now. Ah, now, there we have our problem again. And I repeat, there is no problem. Uh, would you kindly put the mower in the front garden, and I'll come down and fetch it. The, the front garden? Uh, which side would you prefer it? Left or right? I don't mind. I'm coming down now. The man's as mad as a hatter. <laughs> Mr. Trotter! Mr. Trotter! Damn! Wouldn't he let you have it, Father? He would not. Uh, Daniel Trotter speaking. Why didn't you answer the door? I knocked and rang I don't know how many times. I know, it kept me awake. Look here, sir. Why was my mower not on the front garden? Well, I didn't feel up to it, I'm afraid. Have you got no one else in the house? No one who could move it, I'm afraid. When am I going to get it back? Well, I'm terribly sorry about it. I dare say, but when am I going to get it back? Well, I'm most awfully sorry. You may have to wait until I get over my mumps. The doctor says you haven't, does he? I'm afraid I don't go in for doctors. They've killed too many of my family already. If you take my advice, you'll steer clear of them, too. What I want at the moment is not your advice, but my mower. Yes, it is a problem, isn't it? If you haven't had a doctor, how do you know you've got mumps? Well, I've got a book. I dare say you have, so have I. Oh, is yours by a Look fellow... here, Sam. I don't care whether you've got mumps or not. I want my mower back. I know you do, and I should feel exactly the same in your position. And if you had mumps, you'd feel like me. Are you going to return my mower or not? Of course I am, and I'm terribly sorry for the delay. But we seem to have reached an impasse. When will you be better? Well, according to this book, I shall be ill for about a fortnight and infectious for another fortnight. Hmm. Well, now, that means a month, doesn't it? Hmm. Uh, will you be able to manage till then? Look, uh, perhaps you could borrow one from a friend. Uh, what is to stop your putting the mower in the front garden when you feel better? Oh, it seems very ungrateful letting you fetch it. It's been so useful to me. And it's a jolly good machine. Except for the broken blade, of course. The broken blade? There was no broken blade when the machine was lent to you. You mean that you think I've broken it? Well, I do. Oh, I could hardly think so. It was in perfect order when I lent it to you. Well, so it is now. Except for the blade. There was no broken blade when I lent it to you. Have you any witnesses? <laughs> what can I do with a fellow, Digby? <laughs> now he's broken the thing. Why on earth did I ever lend it to him? Well, well, perhaps he could throw a key down and we could go in and fetch it. Uh -huh. Perhaps you could throw a key down and we could go in and fetch the mower. I'm afraid it can't be done. Why not? Well, uh, first of all, I have to keep the windows closed. The book says so. And secondly, if you came through the house, you might catch mumps. And if you did, well, I'd never forgive myself. Well, somebody else in the house can surely open the door to me and I'll take the risk of that. Oh, too dangerous. They've all got it now. Oh, look here. Really, I should borrow one if I were you. <laughs> and now, if you'll forgive me, I must go to sleep again. The book is most insistent on it. <laughs> well, Mr. Trotter, I've had enough of this. Unless the mower is delivered here by noon tomorrow, you will hear from my... Yes, yes. Well, you'll hear... From whom shall I hear if the mower is not returned by noon tomorrow? <laughs> oh, go to blazes! You know, the fellow's getting me down. Do you know, I, I nearly said he'd hear from my solicitors. Solicitors? <laughs> no, thank you. They're even worse than Mr. Trotter. No, this is a police case. I'll go and see old Glossop in the morning. Good morning, sir. Glossop, have you had mumps? Mumps, sir? Well, I have, as a matter of fact. Good. I want you to arrest a man for stealing. He says he's got mumps, but I don't believe it. What's the charge, sir? Stealing my lawnmower. When did he take it, sir? I lent it to him and he won't give it back. That's not stealing, I'm afraid, sir. It might be what the lawyers call fraudulent conversion. Never mind about the lawyers. Can you get my mower back for me? Well, I can ask him for it, sir. But I suppose you've done that. I have indeed. 
Why won't he give it back, sir? Well, he makes all sorts of excuses, but the truth is that the man's crackers, I suppose. What does the doctor say, sir? Well, he won't have a doctor. He uses a book. A book, sir? <laughs> Never mind. What can you do to get the thing back for me? Well, sir, we can try peaceful persuasion. Shall we uh, go along now, sir? I'll uh, just put my coat on, sir. You know, he's in there all right. He just won't answer. Is there anyone in? Is there anyone in? <laughs> we, we'd best go back to my house and telephone. Is that Mr. Trotter? It is. This is Police Constable Glossop, sir. I've had a complaint from Major Buttonstep that he lent you a motor more and you won't give it back to him. I won't give it back to him, Constable? Oh, there must be some mistake. I want to give it back to him. It's no good to me, and it's taking up room in the shed which I can ill spare. we just been to your house and couldn't get no reply. Oh, I'm sorry, but I've got rather cold. And gone to bed. Well, haven't you got mumps, sir? Mumps? What on earth do you mean? Nothing of the kind. I've just got the cold. The Major tells me you said you had mumps and give that as an excuse for not giving up the machine. Oh, he must have misunderstood. This line is rather bad. <coughs> well, sir, would you kindly put the moor in your front garden, sir? Uh, not at the moment, I'm afraid. I don't feel quite up to it. <coughs> then will you let me come and fetch it, sir? No, I'm afraid not. Ask the Major to be kind enough to send for it in the morning. And not before ten or after eleven. Goodbye, officer. Just lock or ring. Or both. <coughs> Can't we break the door down? Afraid not, sir. Forcible entry on land. But what about forcible detention of my property? Now, that's different, sir. The superintendent says if he hasn't made away with it, it's nothing to do with the criminal law. You can't prove he sold it or anything like that, can you, sir? Well, of course I can't. But I can prove that he's had it and won't return it. Mr. Trotter! Mr. Trotter! You mean to say there's nothing you can do, Glossop? It's ridiculous. Very sorry, sir. But unless you can show he's made away with it, it's not a police matter. Yes, but you must be able to do something. There must be some law against it. Oh, yes, sir. You could sue him in the county court. The county court? <laughs> Never. I've had one go there, thank you. Cost me 50 pounds. The machine isn't worth it. It isn't worth anything, I expect, by now, if he smashed all the blades. I'm no lawyer, sir. But uh, if he's damaged it, I expect you can make him pay for it. How? In the county court. The county court? No, thank you. Let's go and telephone the fellow again. Daniel Trotter speaking. This is Constable Glossop speaking, sir. I called round with the major to get the machine, but it wasn't there. And you wouldn't answer the door. I thought you were going to break it down. You mustn't do that, you know. Why wasn't it there, sir? Why? Because you came at the wrong time. You said not before ten or after eleven, sir. And we come at ten fifteen. Oh, you must have misunderstood. I said before ten or after eleven. Well, it's after eleven now. We'll come for it right away. Well, can't be done, I'm afraid, officer. When I heard you go away, I thought you'd finish for the day, and I made my arrangements accordingly. Let me speak to him. Uh, look here, Trotter. I don't know what your game is, whether you're mad or whether you've simply sold the machine, but I give you a final warning. Unless you put that machine out at once, you will take the consequences. Oh, really? Oh, oh, oh. What a fuss to make about an old mower. And you mustn't suggest I'm mad or that I've stolen your machine either. That's what most people call libel. But lawyers call it a slander. As you're standing next to the constable, he could hear what you said, and I shall require an immediate apology, or you will hear from my solicitors. 
You will have your machine back as soon as I finish with it, and not before. After all, you lent it to me. If you didn't intend me to use it, why let me have it? That's what lawyers uh, call an implied condition. You promised to let me have it back on Friday. Well, today is only Monday. Why get so hot under the collar? What's a couple of days? That's what lawyers call oh. de minimis. <laughs> Are you going to put that machine out in the front garden? Certainly. At once? Not so certainly. In a day or two. Oh. Come back on uh, oh, Thursday week. Or, or thereabouts. <laughs> Oh, you'll be pleased to hear the blade isn't broken. It's going very well indeed. Well, for an old machine, that is. That machine was bought new in March. Well, it's a matter of use, isn't it? Some cars are almost as good as new after 18 months. Others have their gears ruined in three. Look, perhaps I could give you some lessons in how to use it. Ooh, it's really had a caning, I must say. How dare you, sir? I haven't had the apology yet. Will you kindly say in an audible voice to the officer, so that I can hear it, that I am neither mad nor a thief? Mm -hmm. I'm waiting. I will say nothing of the kind. You are one or the other. I don't want the damages for myself, but you're certainly piling them up. That's twice you've said it now. The first time you only said it by what the lawyers call no. No. an innuendo. But this time you've said it directly. You said quite plainly that I was either mad or a thief. And you are. Oh, three times lucky. Now, you've no idea what this is going to cost you. I shall give the money to charity, of course. But you'd be able to buy, oh, half a dozen mowing machines with it. You see, I'm new in the village, and you couldn't find a much more important person to slander me to than the village constable. Uh, I mean, if somebody steals something, well, a mowing machine, for example... Oh. And they don't know who's done it? Well, you suspect me because you say I've stolen yours. And then, if some madman sets fire to a hayrick, you suspect me because you say I'm mad. Oh, I know you only said I was mad or a thief, but that won't help you. Oh, no, rather not. That's what lawyers call a pregnant alternative. Confound you, sir! I'm very sorry, sir. He seems a very odd gentleman. What are you going to do, sir? County court him? Certainly not. I'm going to get back my machine, but not that way. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, Digby. Give me a leg up. Right, right. And hey, look out, Father. Here's Glossop. Now keep quite still. <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? Shh, you'll wake him up. Oh, it's not Major Button Step. Do keep your voice down, Glossop. You'll wake up the whole household. I'm trying to get my mower back. But you can't do it that way, sir. It's unlawful to break into an inhabited house. Well, isn't it unlawful to detain someone else's property? Two wrongs don't make a right, sir. And if you break in, sir, it's a crime. But isn't it a crime for him to keep my machine? Not if it's only temporary. Well, the law's a bigger ass than even I thought it was. Well, sir, it's like this. If people were allowed to break into other people's houses, the result might be serious injury to one side or the other or both, sir. People will defend their houses, sir. Well, I'm only trying to defend my mowing machine. Not defend, sir. Retake. Now... Peaceable recapture a chattels, mm. as the lawyers call oh, it. Oh, you and Mr. Trotter are as bad as each other. I don't want to know what the lawyers call anything. Well, I'm very sorry, sir, but while peaceable recapture a chattels is allowed, breaking into someone's inhabited house to get them isn't what the law calls peaceable. It might occasion a breach of the peace. Go away. You'll wake up everyone in the house. You have done. Burglars in button step? I wouldn't have believed it. Who is it out there? It's me. I want my machine back. Oh, what a silly time to come for it. You must be mixing it up with one of your military night into day exercises. But you're not in the army now, Major. Oh, can't have been for a long time, I should imagine. <laughs> Good night, officer. I shan't prefer any charge. But tell him not to do it again, will you? Good night. No, this is ludicrous, Glossop. What am I to do? Well, sir, 
you're not able to use the criminal law or to take it back peaceable yourself, the only alternative is to use the civil law and sue him. Hell. Well, thank you, Glossop. The law. The law. Use the law. I'm terribly sorry, Father. We'll all come down in the morning and I'll speak to him. After all, it's my fault. Ah, good morning, Mr. Trotter. Ah, good morning. I wonder if by any chance your father could lend me a roller. Just for a day, you know. Mr. Trotter... I should be most grateful if you'd let me have my father's mowing machine back first. Then we could discuss the roller. But I want to use one after the other. Haven't you finished with the mower yet? No, I'm afraid not. Roll first and cut afterwards. Now, be a good chap and bring it round, will you? Mr. Trotter, I really must ask you to bring the machine outside. Why must you do that? Because it's my father's machine and he wants it. How badly does he want it? Very badly, as a matter of fact. Well, he's certainly been here bellowing like a bull. Oh, he, he brought a policeman with him once. What's he frightened of? Think I'll attack him or something? I shouldn't dream of attacking someone who's been good enough to lend me his more. Goodbye. Ah, doctor. Well, Digby, what's the matter? Uh, thanks for coming. Look, I'm sorry to worry you, but uh, would you mind coming and listening to this conversation? Uh, this fellow wants certifying, I think. Mr. Trotter! Mr. Trotter! What is it now? This is Dr. Martin. Oh, how do you do, Doctor? I'm new here. Hope I shan't be requiring your services for some time. <laughs> oh, I hope not. Now, uh, Mr. Trotter, would you mind explaining to the Doctor why you won't return Father's mowing machine? Well, I will. But last night your father tried to break into my house. And I must confess I wasn't pleased. But why didn't you let him have it back before then? Dick Berry, you mean to say that your father did try to break in here? I can't believe it. Y yes, he did as a matter of fact, but I can explain. Well, is your father all right? Perhaps I'd better come and look at him. Mr. Trotter, the only reason my father came here last night was because you refused time and again to give the machine back. I never refused. It just wasn't convenient. And then he tries to break into my house. Well, it would have served him right if he had broken in and I'd hit him on the head in mistake for a burglar. <laughs> Come to think of it, from the way he's behaving, perhaps someone has hit him on the head. Now, if you'll forgive me, there are one or two things that I've got to do. Well, Doctor? He seems sane enough, but I must say it seems odd of your father to behave like this. But you don't know what's happened. He's treated my father outrageously. Well, of course, if you say so, Digby, no doubt he has. But I can't see the slightest evidence of insanity. Well, I did at first. When he spoke of your father trying to break in, I thought it must have been an hallucination. Well, see you again soon. Must be off. Oh, goodbye, Doctor. I'll tell Father how helpful you've been. Father? Father? Well, Digby, it's no good, Father. John? Yep. You go and have a try. Okay. Mr. Trotter? Mr. Trotter? Who are you? My name is John Buttonstead. Oh, oh, mine's Daniel Trotter. How do you? I've come about the machine. I see. Are there any more of you? My father would like his machine back, please. But do tell me, have you any brothers and sisters? They'll be coming later, I suppose. Good morning to you. Well, John. Sorry, Father. Hopeless. Well, where do we go from here? I'm not going to let the fellow get away with it. Glossop said the only thing to do is to county court him. I hate the idea, but what else is there? Father, why not see Jane? She's a solicitor. Is she really qualified? Of course, she's jolly good. Well, as I said, I hate the idea. But I'm not going to let Master Trotter play fast and loose with me. Good morning, Major. Well, I issued the summons and he's gone to a solicitor who says he's going to defend the action and counterclaim for damages. Counterclaim, eh? Mm. 
Oh, that'll be for my climbing up the wall when old Glossop stopped me. No, they're not complaining of that. And what are they claiming for? They say that you said to PC Glossop that Mr. Trotter had either stolen the machine or that he was mad. So I did, so he is. What about him? Well, they call it slander and ask for damages. And what do you call it? Well, if we could prove he was mad or that he'd sold the machine or something like that, we could prove it was true, but... If we can't prove either of these things, we'll have to rely on privilege. Now, look, here's a man who borrows my mower, won't give it back, behaves like a lunatic whenever we ask for it, and you tell me that he can sue me because I say so. I've never heard such nonsense. No, we can't stop him counterclaiming, but, as I said, we can rely on the defence of privilege. Now, why can't you lawyers talk plainly? What does privilege mean? If you say something without malice to someone to whom you have a right or duty to say it, they can't sue you for it. But he has sued me, or counterclaimed, or whatever you call it. I mean, his claim won't succeed. Oh, how many hundreds of pounds is that going to cost me, may I ask? Well, if he loses, it won't cost you anything, if he can pay the costs. And suppose I lose? I'm afraid that would be rather expensive. As I thought. I'd have done much better to let him keep the beastly machine. I knew I was right. Now I'm up to my eyes in the law. I think he's treated you abominably, and I really don't see why you should put up with I it. I dare say you don't. <laughs> Indeed, as a lawyer, you wouldn't. If people put up with things, there'd be no work for you. <laughs> now listen. If I give up the claim to the mowing machine, will he give up his claim for the slander, do you think? Oh, I should think he would if he's sensible. But are you really going to make him a present of the machine? Well, what else can I do, my dear girl? Oh, no, 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 I'm not blaming you in any way. You've got your job to do and you're living to earn. But we had a slander action in our family once. It lasted three weeks in one court and a week in another. It took two years or more altogether, and both sides had forgotten what the slander was before we'd finished. We were both so busy paying our lawyers we couldn't think of anything else. No, no, he can have the blasted mower. And I'll never lend anything else to anyone so long as I live. Well, then, Major, your definite instructions are to agree to withdraw your claim if they'll withdraw theirs. Definite? I can feel the suction of the legal machine already. I'm not going to be drawn into it this time, even if it means giving in to that madman. All right, I'll telephone Mr. Deltry, his solicitor, and make the suggestion, but I really do think it's too bad. I can just hear Mr. Deltry giving the good news to Mr. Trotter. Mr. Trotter, I have some good news for you. Mm -hmm. I must say it's most unexpected. I told you that you'd no defence to the claim for the mowing machine and that your claim for slander might very well fail. And you told me to go ahead. Well, you were right, Mr. Trotter, and I was wrong. They've given in. If you withdraw your claim, the Major will withdraw his. If we accept, who keeps the mower? Well, it... uh... It belongs to Major Button's death. Yes, we all know that, but I've got it, so can I keep it? Um, I shall have to consult counsel about that. Well, I shouldn't do that. I will not accept their offer. But you won't accept it? Well, that's madness, Mr. Trotter. I'll be suing you soon, Mr. Deltry. Hmm? You've had me examined by two doctors, and they say I'm not mad, don't they? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Trotter, I didn't mean... Never mind, never mind, neither did I. Now, now, but they've got the wind up. Anyone can see that. That's the time to go for them. No quarter, no parley. He wanted a fight. Well, he shall have it. Very well, Mr. Trotter. I'll let the Major's solicitors know. I'm afraid, Major, you're not going to like this, but they won't settle. What do you mean, Jane? It's my claim. I can withdraw it if I like, can't I? Uh, Yes, but uh, the counterclaim... Mr. Trotter wants £1,500 damages. What did you say? £1,500. Good God. But you told me that I'd win my claim and that he'd lose his counterclaim. I still think so. Well, his lawyers can't or they wouldn't ask. What was the sum? I still can't believe it. Did you really say 1,500 pounds? I'm afraid I did. If you like, I'll I'll speak to my father about it. I wish you would. 1,500 pounds. 1,500... Now it's a bloodsucker. Well, Father, what do you say? There's something very odd about this case, Jane. If Trotter won his counterclaim, which is very doubtful, he'd never get more than 50 or 100 pounds at the most. Why does he ask 1,500? It doesn't make sense. Either the Major or Trotter is keeping something back, but which I I just don't know. One thing I'm certain of, you don't know the whole truth yet. 
What's the Major to do? Well, he'll have to fight, won't he? Mm. But be sure he's not keeping something back from you. I've never been wrong yet when I felt there was something behind the case. But which side's it on? That's the question. Mm. Oh, thank you, Father. I'll have a careful talk with the Major. Well, Jane, it was very good of your father to tell me not to pay 1,500 pounds for nothing. But quite frankly, I couldn't do it if I wanted to. Well, what happens now? We go to court, I suppose. Who's going to appear for me? Um, what, yes, did we? Well, I thought Prunella would be as good as anyone, Father. Keep it in the family, eh? <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. No, no, I certainly didn't. Oh, I can easily brief someone else. No, no, of course not. If I've got to have a case, I might as well have two pretty girls to fight it for me. Who's appearing for Trotter? Mr. Deltry tells me he's instructing Mr. Larpent. Oh, what's he like? Will Prunella be able to cope with him? Oh, certainly. I can best describe him by saying he's in a perpetual state of being very much obliged indeed. I'm most obliged to my learned friend. Not at all. Uh, Mr. Larpent, I'd much prefer you to get on with the case instead of exchanging pleasantries with Miss Coombe. I'm very much obliged, Your Honour. Your Honour, I submit that it is for the defendant to begin. <laughs> he admits the machine is my client, that it's in his possession, and that he hasn't returned it. And what do you say to that, Mr. Larkin? Your Honour, if my learned friend will forgive my crossing swords with her on this particular issue, I would say this. All that is admitted is a demand and a failure to return, not a refusal. If I may take an extreme case... Uh, suppose Your Honour had borrowed an article from a friend and the friend came to collect it and asked Your Honour for it, but Your Honour was unable to return it because you were dead. Would that be unlawful detention? I venture to submit not. But may I at once add that that was merely an example and we all hope, for my part, most profoundly that Your Honour will live to grace the bench, if I may respectfully say so, for many a long day. That's very nice of you, Mr. Larpent, but I'd prefer you would get on with the case instead of wishing me long life. I want to finish this case while I'm still young enough to try it. Of course, Your Honour. Uh, well, suppose Your Honour were just asleep and did not hear, or suppose you were ill and, uh, uh, though you heard the request, you could not comply with it. Uh, surely that would not be detention. There must be a refusal to deliver up. There was a failure to deliver up at your client's own house where the mowing machine was at that moment. Uh, well, Your Honour, if Your Honour, with all Your Honour's experience, the benefit of which we in this court have had, and if I may respectfully say so, I hope we'll have for a long time. Mm. If Your Honour thinks that... I will accept that the burden of proof is on my client. Very well, Mr. Larkin. Then you begin. If all her pieces. The claim is, if I may say so, a very simple one. The only issue is whether the defendant actually refused to return the machine. Has he returned it not? He has not, Your Honor. But there is a reason. It is all bound up, if I may say so, with the counterclaim. And that, I venture to say, is the nub of the matter. Mm. Major Buttonstead said and repeated twice in the presence of a police officer that my client was either mad or that he had stolen the machine. Now, I hope I'm not one of those advocates, Your Honour, who say of every slander, I cannot think of anything more grave that the plaintiff could have said. He could, for example, have called my client a, a murderer or, or a blackmailer. He could have said he was a, a robber of offertory boxes, that he kidnapped children or was trying to poison his wife. He did none of these things. He said he had stolen a mowing machine or was mad. A lie goes round the world, it has been said, while truth is putting her boots on. Do you think that Mrs. Temperley, who keeps the village post office in store, would not soon hear about it? What credit will the plaintiff get at her shop? He may be honest, but if so, he is mad. Lunatics are not the best customers. He may be sane, but if so, he is a thief. No credit for him. And what about the local inn, where he may wish to repair for a quick drink? Can't Your Honour see the nudges and the looks and hear the whispers when he comes in? Won't the landlord make sure he has his money before he hands over the pint? Uh, forgive me, Mr. Larpent, but every landlord ought to do that if he wants to be sure of his money. <coughs> An innkeeper cannot sue for a debt in respect of beer, cider or perry to be consumed on the premises. That's my point, Your Honour. In most cases, a landlord will be prepared to take a risk. And what is the defence to the claim for slander? Only privilege, Your Honour. And my answer to privilege is malice. If Major Buttonstep had not been actuated by malice when he spoke the words, he would have apologised for them. But not a word of apology or withdrawal. Did he write a letter to Constable Glossop and say that my client had not stolen the machine and was not mad? No, he did not. I ask myself, why not? I ask your honour, why not? 
Why not, I repeat? And I wish you wouldn't, Mr. Larpent. I got the point the first time. I'm so sorry, Your Honour. It's difficult for an advocate to know what facts are retained in the learned judge's mind and what are not. And look, Mr. Larpent, as far as I can see, the facts in this case could be stated in about 50 words. That would take me about uh, 20 seconds to say, you've been going for 20 minutes. I do hope I'm not weary, Your Honour. Well, as you ask me, you are, Mr. Larpent. Very well, then, Your Honour, that is all I wish to say to Your Honour about the facts. As to the law, however, I have brought a number of authorities which may interest Your Honour. What point of law arises? Ah, that depends, Your Honour, but I think it possible that as few slander actions are tried in the county court, Your Honour might care for me to refresh Your Honour's memory, if I might respectfully put it that way, uh, with the main ingredients of this cause of action. If you simply wish to deliver a lecture on the law of slander, Mr. Larpent, I need not trouble you. No doubt the Council of Legal Education would be grateful for any offers you care to make to them. Oh, Your Honour, I do hope Your Honour doesn't think that I was implying... I do think, Mr. Larpent, that that is exactly what you were implying. Oh, Your Honour, I'm so very sorry. I'll call Mr. Trotter straight away. Mr. Trotter, please. What is your full name? Daniel Trotter. Take the book in your right hand. Tell me, Mr. Trotter, where is the machine now? In my garden. Are you prepared to return it to the plaintiff? Certainly. When? When he's paid me the damages which the judge orders. I am not mad. I did not steal his mowing machine. And it was a slander to say I was one or did the other. And that's for his honour to say. The learned judge might, for example, I do not say for a moment he will, but the learned judge might say that the plaintiff was protected by what we lawyers call privilege. Yes, you did say something about that when I was in your chambers. Remind me, please. Uh, was... Now, Mr. Larpent and Mr. Trotter... I'm not prepared to listen to this conversation any longer. Mr. Trotter, you were asked a perfectly proper question. Kindly answer it. I'm afraid I've forgotten it now. Well, I'm not surprised. The question was, when will you hand over the machine if I do not award damages to you for slander? But I've never considered such a possibility. Well, consider it now, please. What, here and now, standing in this witness box? Certainly. Why, well, I don't think I could, Your Honour. My heart's beating like I don't know what. How can I really consider anything from here? You may sit down if you prefer it. Oh, but the seats are so uncomfortable. I, I ache all over as it is. If you are trying to be funny, Mr. Trotter, you will get into very serious trouble. Oh, I shouldn't dream of such a thing, Your Honour. But you frighten me more than ever now. How I shall be able to continue my evidence, I really don't know. You see, Your Honour, I've never been in a court before let alone in a witness box, and I find it a very unnerving experience. It's easy enough to forget things and get things wrong in ordinary conversation, but I wonder everything didn't fly out of my head as soon as I took the oath. I'm just an ordinary man who goes about his business... That will do, Mr. Trotter. ...who goes about his business in an ordinary way and who does Be doesn't... quiet, Mr. Trotter. You are certainly not tongue-tied. But I do, as it happens, realise that witnesses may be very nervous and that, in consequence, their minds may go blank oh. all of a sudden. <laughs> yes, yes. But occasionally, people even faint. Oh, great, great, great. You can leave it to me to see that you're fully protected. Now, try to pull yourself together and answer this question. If you get no damages, when will you return the mowing machine? Well? My mind's gone blank. Now, look here, Mr. Trotter. Now, now, you're threatening me again. It isn't easy for me, is it? First you threaten me, and then you say you will help me, and then you threaten me again. Oh, dear. I believe I feel faint. Oh, let the witness have a chair. I, I don't like the idea. Sit down, sir. Supposing it tips over, who will pay the damages? Let the chair be placed outside the witness box. Uh, yes, what is it, Mr. Larpent? Uh, forgive me, Your Honour. I only wish to remind Mr. Trotter that he is still on oath, even though he's not actually in the witness box. I trust Your Honour will forgive me for intervening, but I have known a witness who did not appreciate that fact. Oh, very well. Now, suppose we get on. Mr. Trotter, if you don't get any damages, when will you return the machine? Could I have a glass of water, please? Very well. <coughs> Do you feel all right now? No. What's the matter? Well, it's the, um, it's the atmosphere, Your Honour. Oh, 
Open some windows, please. Is that better? Oh, I didn't mean that kind of atmosphere. I meant the general atmosphere of the court. As a matter of fact, it's going to get a bit chilly with those windows open. Oh, Mr. Lockhart. Your Honour. I hope your client understands that if he's being impertinent, I shall not hesitate to use my powers under section... section. I think your Honour means section 139. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Oh. Oh, the more important part of that seems to be repealed. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honour. Oh, yes. Hmm. Oh, this is odd. I can still fine under section 139, but the bar of imprisonment appears to have been removed. Uh, oh, no, 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 oh, no, I see. For some reason, I'm given the power of imprisonment by section 29 of the um, 1956 Act, while the power of fining remains under section 139 of the uh, uh, 1934 Act. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, well, however that may be, your client must remember that both powers exist. Now, Mr. Trotter, when will you hand back the machine if you get no damages? Well, it's major button steps more, and I really don't see why you shouldn't have it. Thank you, Mr. Trotter, that is all. Oh, thank you. No, 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 don't go away. I expect Miss Coombe would like to ask you some questions. Mr. Trotter, has your behaviour in court been a fair guide to your behaviour outside it? By no means. You'll find me quite normal and ordinary outside court, as I was telling his honour. But I've got the jitters in here all right. Have you ever had mumps? Certainly not. Did you not tell my client first that you had mumps in the house, and then that you had them yourself? Yes, I did say something of the kind. It was untrue. Naturally. Why did you tell my client an untruth? Well, I wanted to put him off. Why? It was not convenient to return the mower at that time. Why didn't you say that instead of telling a lie? Uh, Major Buttonstep's attitude was provocative. I'm quite a peaceable person unless I'm provoked. But then I may become awkward. So, you became awkward to Major Buttonstep? I hope so. Don't you think he might have mistaken your awkwardness for mental derangement? I don't see why he should. A lot of people are awkward. That doesn't mean that they're mad. Have you ever been in to buy a stamp and the clerk just ignores you? Doesn't say, oh, I'm so sorry, I've got to do something else before I can serve you, but just takes no notice of you whatever? Well, that's awkward, if anything is. But the people who do it aren't mad. But why did you make such difficulties about returning the machine? I was being awkward. Were you more than usually awkward? Now, that's a difficult question. I was more awkward than usual. You admit that? Certainly. Usually I'm not awkward at all. But when you are awkward, you're not usually so awkward as this. Now, I didn't say that. Well, are you? I couldn't say. What seems awkward to some people doesn't worry other people at all. I mean, some people won't let it be awkward, if you see what I mean. And if the Major hadn't kept on asking for his machine back, I shouldn't have had the chance to be awkward to him. At any rate, you admit that you were particularly awkward to my client. I admit I was awkward. I'm not prepared to agree to any adjectives or adverbs or whatever they are. Awkward I intended to be and awkward I was. And that's an end of it. If the plaintiff had only said to the policeman, Mr. Trotter's being awkward, I would have had no complaint at all against him. I'd have been glad to hear him say it. Because if he said I was being awkward, it meant that he felt I was being awkward. And when I'm being awkward, I like people to feel it. You wanted to annoy my client. Certainly. Do you think you succeeded? Oh, I'm quite sure of it. I mean, look at him. He's bursting with rage even at this moment. Behave yourself, Mr. Trotter. You're not to insult people in the court. I was only being awkward, Your Honour. Well, you're not going to be awkward within the precincts of this court, or I shall be forced to exercise my... Section 29 or Section 139. Mr. Lopp. Your Honour. I don't like to deal with litigants for contempt of court during the progress of the case, but I cannot overlook his conduct any more. I shall find him five pounds. That is under section 139, Mr. Trotter. Thank you. If he misbehaves again, I shall send him to prison. <laughs> that will be under section 29. Quite well. Now, do let us get on. So, you intended to make my client angry and you think you succeeded? Yes. A pretty poor return for the kindness he'd shown you. 
Don't you think that the average person would think such ingratitude uh, could only be the product of a warped mind? Well, of course, there isn't an average person. Everyone, however ordinary, has some peculiarity of mind or body which most people don't have. Your average person is just a fiction. Thank you for the lecture. Now answer this, please. Do you not think that the ordinary man in the street would have thought you were out of your mind if you treated him like that? That's the same question again. There isn't an ordinary man in the street. Look, if you looked out of that window, you'd see, well, say, half a dozen people. Well, one of them would uh, perhaps suffer from asthma. Another would be uh, claustrophobic. Uh, another would have indigestion and another... That would do, Mr. Trotter. You are, of course, in a sense, perfectly right. There is no average man. But you know quite well what Miss Coombe is referring to. The people whose peculiarities are not pronounced, who are, in fact, as near to the notional average man as one can have. What effect do you think your behaviour would have had on such a person? He'd have been annoyed. Yes, yes, we all know that. But what Miss Coombe is asking you is, would not such a person reasonably have thought you were out of your mind? Not more than anyone else. We're all out of our mind to some extent. Everyone, that is, except the average person who, of course, doesn't exist. Any further questions, Miss Coombe? No, thank you, Your Honour. Now, Constable Glossip, please. What is your full name? Now, Constable Glossip, how would you describe Major Buttonstep's condition when he said that? <laughs> Condition, sir? Uh, was he calm or otherwise? He was annoyed, sir. Did you get the impression that he meant what he said, or did you think he was too angry to think what he was saying? Oh, I think he meant it, sir. Thank you, Constable Glossip. And, officer, what view did you take of Mr. Trotter's behaviour? Well, I... I thought it very odd, miss. I mean, ma'am. I mean... Uh, uh, you should address your remarks to his honour... You thought it very odd. I did, Your Honour. Had you ever known a person to behave as Mr. Trotter behaved? Never, Your Honour. Did he sound normal? He sounded normal, Your Honour. But he didn't behave normal. Did you think he was sane, officer? I must say I wondered, Your Honour. What about the machine? Did you think he might have stolen it? Well, <clears throat> Your Honour... I didn't think he could have stolen it because it was lent to him. But it was possible he'd made away with it, converted it. Did you think he had converted it? I can't say that I did, miss. <laughs> I mean, Your Honor. Why not? Because he admitted he'd had it. He was living in the house. He couldn't help but be found out if he'd sold it or anything. Then why did you think he was behaving as he did? I couldn't think for the life of me. Thank you. And that is all. Unless, perhaps, officer, he was trying to be awkward. That would have explained it, wouldn't it? It could have been that, sir. Thank you, officer. That, Your Honour, is the defendant's case. I'll call the plaintiff straight away. <laughs> what is your full name? Now, Major Buttonstep... When you said that a defendant had either stolen the machine or was mad, what did you believe? I believed what I said to be true. I still believe it. Thank you. That is all. Uh, Major Buttonstep, you still believe it to be true, do you? Certainly. Uh, so you believe he's stolen your machine? Well, I haven't got it back, have I? We've only got his word that he's still got it. If he's sane, I don't believe he has still got it. And if he's still got it... I think he's mad. Well, it can easily be tested. We can all go down to the house and see if it's there. Oh, oh, I see. Well, uh, if we do that, perhaps I can be allowed to take it away, if it's there. That's another matter. Uh, why shouldn't he take it away, if it's there? With the greatest possible respect, I'm entitled to address your honour on the matter first. All right, Mr. Laughlin, address me now, please. Why shouldn't I give judgment for the plaintiff for the return of the machine straight away? What, your honour, in the middle of cross-examining the plaintiff? Certainly. But, but you can't do that in the middle of the plaintiff's cross-examination. Can't I, Mr. Laughlin? You're just going to hear me. Oh, very well, then, Your Honour. I will reserve my client's rights for the Court of Appeal, and I ask Your Honour to make a note of my most respectful protest. I will do so, Mr. Laughlin. 
Jane, Jane, you must stop him. Believe me, I know the form. I don't care whether he's right or wrong, whether I get my mowing machine back or not. But I'm not going to the House of Lords or anywhere else. I'd rather lose the case. Tell your sister to stop him. All right. Brunella, Brunella, stop him. Say you don't want judgment yet. Very well. Yeah. And Mr. Larpent, I think that will enable you to argue the point in the Court of Appeal or the Divisional Court or wherever you like to go. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, my client would rather wait until the end of the case for the return of his mower. So you think I'm wrong too, do you? No, indeed, Your Honor. I'm quite sure Your Honor is right. Then what are you worrying about? Uh, my client doesn't want this case to go to a higher court, even though he wins there. Very well. As neither of you want me to give judgment at this stage, I won't do so. But in view of the fact that I was proposing to take a course to which you objected, Mr. Larpent, would you like the whole case to be reheard before another judge? Indeed, and not as far as I'm concerned, but uh, perhaps I'd better ask my client. In saying that, I do assure Your Honour that I do not intend the least disrespect to Your Honour, that I personally hope that Your Honour will continue with the case. I know that Your Honour will not be unfairly prejudiced by anything that has happened. It is not as if there were a jury. Oh, uh, do consult your client, please, Mr. Larpent. I'm quite sure that you are incapable of the least disrespect to the court. Your Honour is very kind, I'm most obliged. Well, do consult yes. your client. Yes, Your Honour, please, is. I will do so immediately. I am most grateful to Your Honour for the opportunity. If I may say so... No, Mr. Honor... Larpent, you may not consult your client, please. At once, Your Honour. If Your Honour will allow me to take him outside the court so that I can explain to him the full implications... I will allow anything if you will consult your client. Very good of Your Honour, then. With Your Honour's permission, I will withdraw... Go away, go away, Mr. Larpent. Kindly take your client outside the court and explain matters to him. At once, Your Honour. And don't let's waste any more time. Now, Mr. Larpent, what is all this in aid of? Well, the judge has offered you a new trial before a different judge. Why? One's enough, isn't it? The reason is because he had proposed to do something irregular. You see, by offering you a new trial, he prevents your complaining of his behaviour if you decide to go on with the case before him. <laughs> Wily old devil. Where did he learn that trick? Uh, Mr. Trotter, I don't think you should speak of the learned judge like that. Why not? You won't tell him, will you? Of course not. OK, we'll go on. Very well, I'll inform the judge. Well, Mr. Larpin? My client will be delighted if Your Honour will be good enough to go on with the case. Very well. Now, look here. I didn't say delighted, Mr. Deltry. I only said OK. It's all right, Mr. Trotter. It's just the legal way of putting it. Now, let's get on. Where were we? I was uh, cross-examining the plaintiff about his belief. Uh, will you go back into the box, please, Major Buttonstep? Now... Uh, suppose the machine is at Mr. Trotter's house. Do you say on your oath that you think he is a lunatic? Well, certainly I do. Why should a sane man cause all this bother and expect? You've heard his explanation that he wanted to be awkward. Don't you believe it? Well, I think that anyone who wanted to be as awkward as Mr. Trotter was to me must be out of his mind. Do you still say that, although doctors have examined him and found him to be sane? In that case, I think the doctors want examining. That is your answer, is it? That the doctors are insane? Well, I don't see how any sane man who was told how Mr. Trotter had behaved could think that he was sane. But your solicitor and counsel have admitted that Mr. Trotter is sane. Well, perhaps he's recovered. Well, he doesn't give much sign of it. No, no, that won't do, Major Buttonstep. Your advisers have admitted that the defendant was at all material times sane. I don't know what that means. It means that they admit he was sane while you were talking to Constable Glossop. Well, I repeat that if he was sane, then he's made away with the machine. But your advisers admit that he hasn't made away with it. Well, they can admit what they like. I'm telling you what I believe. But you can't. But I have. And why shouldn't he? It is admitted on behalf of Major Buttonstep that Mr. Trotter is in fact neither dishonest nor insane. But that doesn't mean that the plaintiff doesn't and didn't believe him to be one or the other, if Your Honour pleases. Now, Major Buttonstep, did you not appreciate when you were speaking in front of Constable Glossip that it was a very serious thing to say a man has stolen your machine? Well, less serious than stealing it. How would you like it if a complete stranger borrowed something from you and then treated you as Mr. Trotter treated me? You mustn't ask me questions. And that's quite true, Mr. Larpent. But I would have been interested to hear the answer. I think we'll adjourn for lunch now, and during the adjournment, you can ascertain if the machine is still on the defendant's premises. I'll sit again at uh, 1.30.
Major Buttonstep, you now have seen that the defendant has not made away with the mower. Well, he's got it now, but uh, how am I to know that he hasn't brought it back for the purposes of the case? Are you suggesting that my client, in fact, converted the machine? I've no idea what you mean by that, but I'm suggesting nothing. But I'm telling you that in my belief, your client is either dishonest or insane. You've said that before. And I'll say it again, whenever you ask me the same question. That, Your Honour, is the plaintiff's case. Well, Mr. Larkin, what have you got to say on behalf of Mr. Trotter? Well, isn't it for Miss Coombe to address you first, Your Honour? It would be if I were against her client, Mr. Larkin. Oh, Your Honour, I can see I have a very difficult task ahead of me. You have, Mr. Larkin, but don't let me depress you too much. If Your Honour pleases. Now, in this case, Your Honour, which, if I may say so, with the greatest possible respect, Your Honour has listened to with the patience we have become accustomed to in Your Honour's court, And in my submission, therefore, which I hope has not wearied your honour too much, there should be judgment for Mr. Trotter. You've only been one hour, Mr. Larkin. There are 24 in the day. Your honour is very kind. Oh, I hadn't noticed it. Now, um, in this case, I have come to a clear conclusion. Apart from his perhaps rather ill-advised, though quite understandable, attempt to regain his own property, the plaintiff's conduct in all the matters relating to this case has been exactly what one would expect of a decent, fair-minded, generous Englishman. The defendant's behaviour, on the other hand, has, in my view, been that of a lunatic. I haven't the least doubt that any ordinary person placed in Major Buttonsep's position would certainly have thought and probably have said... This man is either a thief or a lunatic. And now, if you please, Mr. Trotter, who has caused all this trouble by his deliberate awkwardness, has the temerity to come to this court and ask for damages because Major Buttonstep said what most people would have said. The facts have only to be stated to show how ludicrous the defendant's claim is. I am satisfied that, though angry, the plaintiff honestly believed that what he said was true. The counterclaim for slander accordingly fails. As far as the claim for the return of the machine is concerned, there is no defence whatever to it. And the defendant has behaved disgracefully in not returning the plaintiff's property to him. I shall accordingly order the defendant to deliver up the machine to the plaintiff immediately. And in addition, I shall award um, uh, 30 pounds damages for the detention. The costs scale for. <clears throat> yes, what is it, Mr. Larpent? You aren't asking for a stay of execution pending appeal, are you? Well, Your Honour, with the greatest possible respect, although I can tell from Your Honour's voice, Your Honour will forgive me for saying so, that such an application is not likely to find favour with Your Honour. I am quite sure that Your Honour will listen to me with that patience for which Your Honour is, if I may say so, renowned. Not only here, but if you will forgive me referring to the matter throughout the temple... That will do, Mr. Larpent. What is there to appeal about? The punitive damages for one thing, Your Honour. Your client is lucky I didn't award £400 damages against him. I shall grant no stay of any kind. You must go to the Court of Appeal if you want one. But, Your Honour, as Your Honour has ordered the immediate return of the machine, there won't be time to get to the Court of Appeal to ask for a stay of execution. And a good thing, too. And thank you for reminding me. I shall authorise the Court to give priority to the issue of the warrant for delivery of this machine. Miss Coombe, uh, Your Honour. if your client chooses to go into the office and issue the warrant, I will say that a bailiff should go and take away the machine at once. I am very much obliged to Your Honour. I'm not going to have this, Mr. Larpent. The only way to prevent it, Mr. Trotter, is for us to get to the Court of Appeal in London before the bailiff can get to your house. Well, what are we waiting for, Mr. Larpent? <laughs> your Honour... I hope Your Honour will not think that what I'm about to do implies the slightest criticism of Your Honour's judgment. I don't mind if it does, as long as you do it outside. Good work, Jane. <laughs> That'll give Mr. Trotter and his legal advisers something to think about. Good Lord, Digby, look, there they are, rushing into a car. Look, Jane, they're off. Quick, Major, whenever. Yes, Jane. We must chase them. I'll explain on the way. Whose is the fastest car? Uh, John's can do 120 on the M1. OK, mine. Come on, everybody. Come on, then. Quick, Major. Well, what's all this about? They're obviously going to London. London? Yes, to the Court of Appeal. Oh, appeal? Please jump in, Major. Quick, I'll explain Major. on the way. Come on, come on, Major. Get in, Jane. Jane. Put and you dig me in the sand. Right. Yes, right. Yes, right. Yeah. But surely they can't do anything without our being notified. Well, they might get the order stayed for a day or two. I can catch them with this. Shall I ram them? Oh, good heavens, no. 
we can get Prunella to the Court of Appeal in time, she should be able to put such a spanner in their works they can't do any more about it. <laughs> I must say that you girls did very well before Judge Smooth. <laughs> I'm most grateful to you. But I can't say I like the sound of the Court of Appeal. That's the way things begin to happen. You win in one court, lose in the next, and in the third court, both sides are so fed up that they compromise. And once again, only the lawyers win. Oh, if only John had step on it. I think we'll be able to stop any real fight in the Court of Appeal. What is that 120 you mentioned, Digby? Well, if John tried 120 here, we'd land up at the mortuary, not the law court. There they are. Oh, just keep in touch the whole time. That's splendid. She's just robing. Oh, here she comes. Are they still sitting? Yes. Now, uh, what is it, Mr. Larpent? We were just going to rise. Have you an application to make? Uh, may it please, Your Lordships, I have an urgent ex parte application to make to stay execution on an order of His Honour Judge Smooth until I can serve notice of appeal and of application for a stay. Mm. Uh, what is the nature of the action? Uh, my Lords, it was an action for the return of a mowing machine. The learned judge took a very strong view. He not only ordered the return of the machine, but when I told him my client wished to appeal, he said he'd authorise a bailiff to go and take the machine from my client straight away. I must say, that seems rather high-handed of the learned judge. He may have been right in his judgment, but what harm could two or three days delay do? It's precisely Oh, good Lord, here we go again. It's the Titchborn case all over again. If I, if I may say so with the greatest respect, my Lord, the learned judge seemed determined to prevent an appeal. I knew it. Why ever did I start it? If the plaintiff gets the machine back before the appeal is heard, the appeal might be useless. The plaintiff might, for example, uh, sell the machine. Sell my own machine? Well, why shouldn't he, my Lord? It's his machine. And what are you doing here, Miss Coombe? Oh, I represent the successful plaintiff whose machine it is, my lord. Ah. Well, we can't hear you. This is an ex parte application. Precisely, my lords. My learned friend has no business to be here, if I may say so without offence. I may tell your lordship that she chased us all the way from Cobblestone. I don't think we want to hear about that. <laughs> but what is this case all about? Why is there all this urgency over a mowing machine? Uh, may I say something, my lord? I submit not, my lords. Whose machine is it, Mr. Larpin? I submit that doesn't matter for the purpose of this application. Perhaps you would leave it to us to judge whether it matters or not. Whose machine is it? <laughs> well, my lords, as a matter of fact, if your lordships feel that at this stage it is desirable for your lordships to know the exact position as far as ownership goes in regard to the machine, I'm in a position, if your lordships really think it will help, uh, to enlighten your lordships on that point. But in my respectful submission, my lords... My I... lord asked you a very simple question. Why don't you answer it, Mr. Larpent? <laughs> my lord, I was about to do so. I do assure your lordship that it is no wish of mine or of my client that your lordship should not be put in full possession of the facts, insofar as they may assist the court to arrive at a just determination of this matter. Perhaps I might tell your lordship that the learned judge, in giving judgment... Whose machine is it, Mr. Larpent? Who does it belong to, my lord? Exactly. Who does it belong to? Uh, there should be no difficulty in telling your lordships that. Uh, no difficulty at all. I agree there should be no difficulty, but apparently there is. I hope your lordships don't think I'm trying to evade the question. Well, if you're not, it's a very creditable imitation. Miss Coombe says it's her client's machine, is that correct? I thought your lordships refused to hear my learned friend. Well, we couldn't help hearing that much, and from your reticence, I... Well, perhaps reticence isn't quite the right word. From the way you deal with the matter, it appears to me to have been just as well that we did here, Miss Coombe. Mm -hmm. mm. I gather the machine belongs to the plaintiff and that the learned judge ordered the defendant to deliver it up to the plaintiff straight away. Is that correct? Well, roughly speaking, yes, yes my lords. What's rough about it? Either it's right or it isn't. It is correct, my lord. Well... What's wrong with the learned judge's order, then? My client wishes to appeal against it. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the order. My lords, I can tell your lordships that in the witness box the defendant admitted the machine belonged to the plaintiff and that he had refused to deliver it up to him in order to be awkward. 
I submit that the only object of an appeal is to continue the defendant's attempts to be or could. Is the first part of what Miss Coombe said correct, Mr. Larpent? It is, my lord. Well, Mr. Larpent, your client should be reminded that this court can be quite awkward, too, if the occasion demands it. This seems to be a disgraceful case as far as the defendant is concerned. I'm not surprised the learned judge was indignant. Look, I wouldn't have adventured to suggest that the learned judge was indignant, only that he took a strong view. Well, you can say that I'm indignant, Mr. Lappent. This application will be dismissed. The sooner the plaintiff is given back his property, the better. I ask for costs, my lord. I submit my learned friend can't. Theoretically, she isn't here, and your lordships haven't heard a word she said. But... From the practical point of view, if she hadn't been here and intervened, we might have stayed the learned judge's order. Oh, then, my lords, if it isn't too late, I ask you to stay it now. If, if your lordships oughtn't to have heard Miss Coombe, then to all intents and purposes, your lordships haven't heard Miss Coombe. But we've heard you, Mr. Larpent, and you've admitted the machine is the plaintiff. Yes, I see that, my lord. My learned friend shouldn't have her cost. She came here at her own peril. Quite considerable if she raced all the way from Copleston. It's a good 20 miles. I know the road. I'm glad she arrived safely, my lords, but I submit that her client must bear the costs of her doing so. Well, I don't agree. But for her timely intervention, we might have made a wrong order. It would be unjust if Major Buttonstep had to pay for it. I entirely agree. But, my lord... No, Mr. Larpent. <laughs> the application will be dismissed... With costs. I hope it won't rain before the machine is returned. Thank you, my lords. See you outside, Major. Oh, well done, Prunella. I'm bound to say all the judges in this case behave very differently from what I expected. And what about your counsel, Father? And solicitor, hmm? darling. Well, I haven't had the bill yet. There won't be one if Mr. Trotter pays up. You mean that I'll have nothing to pay whatever? Nothing at all. Well, the law seems to have changed a bit. <laughs> On the awkward side for Mr. Trotter. <laughs> I wonder what he's doing at the moment. Yes. I, I wish I could see. <laughs> well, Mr. Deltry, I don't think Major Buttonstep will lend his mowing machine again in a hurry. Well, if you won't think it offensive of me, I should rather have thought you wouldn't borrow one again. Oh, why not? I can always return it if I'm asked. Uh, I hadn't thought of that. I wasn't born yesterday, you know. It's not the first time I've borrowed a mowing machine. I hope that the previous occasions weren't so expensive. To be quite frank, they weren't expensive at all. I can honestly say that this is the most expensive, friendly loan I've ever had. The gentlemen in German Street have still something to learn. Uh, talking which, if you won't think me offensive, no doubt you'd like a check. I should be much obliged. Well... Here you are. This will cover everything, I think. I'm sorry it's so much. Well, I can't say that you didn't warn me. And I must say you take your defeat very well. No point in doing anything else, is there? I could sit down and howl or refuse to pay your bill or <laughs> hit you over the head with my walking stick. No, 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 please don't move. I can reach you very well from here. But that wouldn't do either of us any good. So instead, I just pay. Oh, by the way, I'd like Major Buttonstep to have his money as soon as possible. I want him to feel that, however he thought of me before, there's a bit of the gentleman in me, even if you have to dig for it. I think you're most wise. It'll be much easier for you as neighbours. Neighbours? Good heavens! You don't think I'm going to stay in Buttonstep anymore, even if I bought a machine of my own. Well, if you change your mind, there's a very good place for gardening things in the high street. I suppose you couldn't lend me one by any chance? Uh, well, um, as a matter of fact... Most unfortunately, mine's out of commission. Of course, Major Buttonstep's got his back by now. Oh, but I rather doubt they it. They can be hired. Oh, well, there's higher purchase. No credit sale. I expect Major Buttonstep's using his. Well, give him my regards. Yes. Yes, I, I, I won't forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, it works perfectly. Good. Stop it, Digby. <laughs> well, my dears, I must say that this case has somewhat changed my views about the law. Oh, and uh, if you two girls are prepared to 
risk your life to these two sons of mine, you'll have my blessing. <laughs> I, I hope you feel happy about it too, Sir George. I'm delighted, Major. I'm sure my daughters are very lucky. But what an extraordinary case. I've been completely wrong about it. I felt quite certain there was more behind it, Jane, but I've been proved wrong. Oh, poor Mr. Trotter. We owe all our happiness to him, and all he's had out of it is a large bill of costs. <laughs> I feel almost sorry for him. And he's had to leave yes. the neighbourhood into the bargain. I do feel sorry for him, too, in spite of his behaviour. Oh, I expect he'll be all right. The 21st of July, then. Is that all right with you, sir, and you, Father? Mm. The 21st, oh, 21st of July. 21st of July. Start it up again, Digby. <laughs> Is Mr. Walker in? He's in his room, sir. Who shall I say? Uh, Digby Buttonstep. But don't bother. I know his room. Come in. My dear Trotter. Oh, I beg your pardon. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> you were magnificent. I can't thank you enough. Oh, not at all. For an out-of-work actor and author, I think I've done very well. Uh -huh. It's the longest and best paid run I've ever had. <laughs> Rent and food free... <laughs> Fifteen guineas a week and all expenses. It's I who should thank you. What made you think of the idea? <laughs> well, it was the girl's father, Mr. Justice Coon, who gave it to me when he said that father's and his family's trouble was that they'd lost too many cases. See, I thought that if we could force him into a case where he'd have a nice easy win, a case even a button step couldn't lose, <laughs> he might see things in a different light. And he has... But you were quite splendid. Well, it was easy. And I'd nothing to lose. I'd everything to gain. I didn't tell a single lie in the witness box. I think it was a good idea to grow a beard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one's going to associate the clean-shaven and very ordinary George Walker, always at your service, <laughs> with the bearded and awkward Daniel Trotter. <laughs> oh, by the way, when you're married, are you going to tell your wife? Well, not for a long time, if ever. If they'd known the whole thing was engineered, they couldn't have been parties to it. They might feel unhappy if they knew. Well, I'm glad to say I don't feel at all unhappy. I can't wait for the next job like it. Uh, could I see Miss Coombe, please? I have an appointment. Major Button step. This way, please. Well, hello, Jane. Hello. How nice to see you. But uh, I'm sorry it's so urgent. What can I do? Well, the fellow's just run his lorry into my gate and done no end of damage. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It must be infuriating. But I suppose you're insured. Insured be blown. I'm going to sue the fellow. Step was played by Cecil Parker and Mr. Trotter by Norton Wayne. Mr. Larpent was played by Rolf Lefever. Judge Smooth by Philip Lever. And P.C. Glossop by Peter Clawton. Prunella Coombe is played by Gudrun Yeur, Jane Coombe by Diana Olson, and Mr. Justice Coombe by Will Layton. Digby Buttonstep was played by John Pullen, John Buttonstep by William Edel, and Archie the Innkeeper by Anthony Vickers. Mr. Deltry was played by Malcolm Hayes, Lord Justice Blake by Derek Birch, and Lord Justice Crewe by Hayden Jones, who also played Dr. Martin. Thank <laughs> you.